My name is Luca Lesson and I'm a full-time poet. I am uh, here to talk to you about resilience and building resilience from a poet's perspective. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say Christos Anesti to my Greek brethren out there celebrating Greek Orthodoxy's uh, Easter today. And uh, even if you are not celebrating that at all, I would like to invite you for a day of renewal, a day of rebirth. Um, as we start on this journey with all these crazy things going on in the planet and we start to figure out what this means for a new world in the future. I'd like to acknowledge that I am on Bunjalung country today. It's where I am broadcasting to you from. And I would also like to acknowledge all the different places that you are broadcasting or you are watching me from and the elders past and present of all First Nations of this country called Australia now and any other country you might be streaming in from as well. Um, there have been uh, many years of storytelling and resilience on this land that we are gathered on or that I am broadcasting to you from today. And I'd just like to acknowledge that some of the ultimate forms of resilience are those that have been shown by First Nations people around the world. Uh, I'd also like to give you a trigger warning that I'm going to speak about war and depression and suicide. So if any of you are sensitive to those discussions, please take care of yourselves and show some self-care. You might want to step away at certain moments when I begin talking about that. I'd like to also start with the definition of resilience, of what it really means to me. Um, for me, it's about enduring great struggles. It's about a propensity to flourish even when the chips are down. Resilience is that flower growing on the top of a dead stump of an old tree. Or as the rapper Tupac Shakur would say, it is the rose that grows from concrete. The song that is sung at full volume in the eye of a storm, the ability to create diamonds from coal, to create a stick of incense from a pile of cow dung and sell it to an unsuspecting hippie for a lot of money. Resilience is for many of us not just a choice, but a vital mode of survival, a survival tactic in crazy times. As Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Dunbar mentions in his poem Sympathy, he says that I know why the caged bird sings. Resilience often connects us with creativity directly. It's a phrase that he says that is also used by Maya Angelou as the title of her book of the same name, which is about her own difficult young years and crawling her way back, finding resilience through poetry as her bird song. It's reminiscent of the same types of resilience shown by people like Nelson Mandela in his years of imprisonment or Pepe Mujica, who was also imprisoned for 12 years by his military dictatorship in Uruguay, only to become the, pres the president of that country and donating a bunch of his wage, I think 70% of his wage, to build houses for the homeless while he was president. This kind of resilience, in my experience, comes from deep inside the gut, incrementally putting space between ourselves and our traumas, and eventually it becomes the ability to invest in ourselves so much that we gain a thick but permeable layer of light around us. And this gives us the sensitivity to still be compassionate towards others and their circumstances, all while enduring great hardships of our own at the same time. It comes from the ability to nourish ourselves even when there is no water to be found, to uphold our sense of dignity in a desert of apathy and have faith in our own selves, even though we're entering completely uncharted territory. From some pool of power, some well of energy, we are able to find the strength to overcome. I would like to start with a quote from one of my favorite poets, Khalil Gibran, who was born in Lebanon. He says that the deeper sorrow carves into our being, the more joy we can contain. He gives the analogy that a cup which is burnt in the fire of a hot oven is the same cup that holds the water that we drink. Or it's the flute that has been carved by sharp knives that also plays the most beautiful of melodies. And I'd like to add to Khalil a bit of notice, um, Nikos Kazantzakis, uh, one of the most famous Greek writers, who said, the only thing I know is this, I'm full of scars, but I'm still standing on my feet. And it's this quote that leads me towards one of my own poems. I hadn't heard this quote when I wrote this poem called Scars, but they seem to mirror each other. This poem is called Scars. In the city, 
scars fall upon us without warning through debilitating accidents, acrimonious attacks, and love. And to feel better in the morning, we are reborn through self-hate and an impossible escape to another love. Left screaming at the gods for inventing pain, we continue sharpening our blades but blaming ourselves and that love. But I believe that we are blessed with the inner reflexes for initiation, to gain scars. I believe we are called to be torn and shattered and graced with razors. The brain is a muscle and muscles must be damaged to grow strong. That which does not kill me, we've known the old adage for so long, so scar. But rip your wounds so open wide, you walk as if inside out. So your heart sits on top of your rib cage, proud and is no longer just worn on one of your sleeves every now and then kid me with your kidneys. Become known as a liver, wear your guts like a scarf so you're never known to shiver. Deliver your soul so you don't need to speak, you just draw diagrams with your diaphragm and lungs so your stance handsomely lands upon the tips of their tongue. Scar, get your guilt amputated. Precious pretenses surgically removed. Jealousy scouts so your intentions, true intentions shine and protrude. Prove your intelligence with your skeleton. A bone through the nose so they know that what you know lives in your bones and it shows. Use your own skin to make a drum to beat. Your hair, the strings on mandolins to make it strum and sing of your scar until you're covered in scratches. Till the scratches get so dense that you're covered in patterns. Then scratch at the patterns till there's no space in between. Till you're so covered in scars that it looks like you're clean then scar your pages with your stationery but don't you dare stay stationary move leave track marks on every page you choose to lay your scars i wrote that poem when i was in a pretty difficult place and I realized quite soon afterwards that resilience isn't so sustainable when it's forcibly or violently pushing up against something. It's also not about trying to build such a thick skin that we become apathetic, ignorant, or even hateful towards other people or the world for what it has done to us. It also tends to destroy us if it involves buying into victimhood as a badge of honor and perpetuating our own personal dramas. At least for me, and I can only speak for myself, this type of resilience doesn't really facilitate my strengthening. It might help me survive a trauma in a moment, but it also helps me to burn out quickly. And for resilience, for, for it to really work for me, I've found that it must be more sustainable. The resilience that I'm talking about is the kind that wrote blues music or rembetica, or flamenco, the kind that led the Cubans to dance the first salsa, the kind that allows an artist to draw from their deepest sense of self and deliver us a song that can make millions of people feel that little bit better about their situations, learning to celebrate in the midst of a storm. And again, that reminds me of another song that I wrote with a great artist from the States, Narco, and Narco from Narco and Medicine for the People. We wrote a song called Celebrate the Storm, and I'll just give you one of those verses. This is for my people who celebrate the storms, cross borders and ignore whenever they are warned. This is for the people who climb up the mountains, never caught lounging, who light up their lanterns. This is for the people who were fought and won, for the fallen ones and for those who have just begun. This is for journeys, pilgrims on the path, forgetting the past finding diamonds in the dark. This is for the kids who can't even write a sentence, but police still try to get sentenced. This is for the poets and the writers, those that inspire us, warriors of the mind, fighting between the lines. And this is for those who know the truth in their hearts and believe it even when the world tears it apart. This is for the migrants who come in on the tides, the stars that advise them to leave their lives behind them. This is for the citizens, First Nations, Indigenous, our respect for you should be limitless. This is for the critics who said, I shouldn't dream. I know you only hate me because you know in yourself you can't believe. This is for the party people, Friday night relief. For the DJs who play it loud just to bring us peace. This is for the people who dance to this rhythm just to get the energy to fight the system, huh?
So now that we've defined exactly what kind of resilience I'm talking about, let's start back at the beginning. I myself was born in Brisbane, a son and grandson of migrants. And from a very early age, I begin to learn what racism feels like. When I was in primary school and high school, Pauline Hanson started raising her head and becoming a fixture of Australian politics. It was a difficult time for me. I got into many fights. Some of you might know a poem of mine called Antidote, where I talk about breaking someone's nose. That was one of those fights that was instigated by Pauline Hanson and her racism. And us as children are just imitating exactly what she was about and the counter arguments to her. I also lost a dear friend of mine named Omar. His death started to show me how resilience really works. After he passed away, me and my friends would always start to shake hands or hug each other when we saw each other or said goodbye. It was the first beginning of me starting to write things on blank pages that would help me to survive. I wrote a diary to my friend for many nights after he passed away. I also started getting interested in politics and hip hop. And of course, Tupac and his contemporaries taught me about what resilience is. And I, it would be remiss for me to say that hip hop was not a huge part of me learning about what resilience can do. I also had many injuries. I broke my arm twice. I dislocated my knee twice. I broke my ankle. There's me still happy even with the broken arm. Um, and in my later years, I had a very heavy breakup, which led to a deep depression. Uh, and I started getting chronic headaches. I started having a headache every single day. And I've had some kind of head pain almost every single day ever since. I went downhill quickly. I started spiraling down to a very dark place. And at that very dark place, I started having suicide, suicidal thoughts. And those suicidal thoughts uh, brought me to point zero. And this poem is about that moment of choosing to stick around. It's called Bones. There are 206 bones in my body and mine are just like yours. But I'll be white ochre if I want to. I'll be bleached by sun and soaked by sand if I want to. I'll be eaten and reclaimed, decomposed and desired if I want to. There are 22 bones in my feet and I've named them after the poets who have walked before me. I will burn if I need to, be dust if I choose to, desire smoke signals of yesterday, reminisce in my own future. I will be a figment of my own imagination if I choose to, I will be rubble, driftwood. Dead weight, dead set, dead poet society. There are 206 bones in our bodies and each will be fine bone, china, teacup, discussion of what could have been. Use my fibula to mark the chalk outline of what went wrong. We form my skeleton into a shape of something you think you can come to terms with. Like how did he? Why did we? When was it? Why wasn't there? Why didn't we? There are 40 litres of water in our bodies, but most of us still can't find a fucking flow. I'll build a dam if I want to. I'll build a river, an estuary, a lake. I'll build a tear duct, the width of your mother's face. I will not let her tell me we can't hear your voice anymore. I can't hear your voice any more than my own sometimes. My heart beats me up all day, and I know you know what that means. I know you miss me, but I wish you'd missed and I'm not ready to shoot the breeze with you. Not ready to fall with you. Not ready to flow, not ready to go, not ready to be that bold with you just yet. Not ready to decompose, disintegrate or dissolve. I'm not ready to feed the dirt just yet. As a poet, we're only ever respected once we're dead. So I guess I'm not ready for fame just yet. I'd rather be anonymous, but breathing. Alive in secret, a bad poet, but livid. Average, but dealing with it. I'd rather be another number than a statistic. There is a difference. I'm not ready to fall just yet. There are 1,000 miles of veins in our bodies and I've given each vein a name. So when I'm gone, you still can't use my name in vain. And there are 36 breaths, 36 deep breaths in this poem that I may have never taken. 
And they are the best thing that I ever wrote. So what did I learn from stepping to the edge? I learned that building my resilience starts with a simple desire to stick around. That every single second of the day, we have a chance to make a choice between actions and thoughts which are going to uplift us, encourage us, develop our resilience, invest in our health, or do the opposite take us back down the hole. So I made a commitment to myself to start the journey forward, to stick around. I went to every healer and expert, every snake oil salesman and expensive surgeon, every neurosurgeon, physiotherapist, acupuncturist, ear, nose and throat specialist, five different GPs, kinesiologists. I took antidepressants for a week and felt completely numb. Didn't work for me might work for other people and that's okay but I did everything that I thought was right I did everything that you could imagine and more and eventually I realized that I couldn't just put my life on hold waiting to be cured before following my dreams that I decided that if I'm going to stick around then I'm going to do what I love despite all my own fears and doubts of the people around me so I did something ridiculous <laughs> and became a poet since writing was where I felt most safe. I've been very lucky to be able to travel around the world doing what I love, teaching in places. I've been to China many times. I've been able to go to win the Australian Poetry Slam. I've toured extensively around the world and accidentally I became extremely interested in a resilience of all forms. And I started listening to stories of young people. I started connecting with people who had been through crazy things, but still seemed to have this bright smile on their faces, much worse than anything I'd been through. And I was able to collect up a bunch of experiences which helped me understand what resilience means. And during this process, I wrote a poem called please resist me and it's my version of the saying what doesn't kill me only makes me stronger please resist me colonize me compromise me conflict me please don't risk me if you see me at the airport please come frisk me please resist me Colonize me, compromise me, and conflict me. Please don't risk me. Please call me stupid because your resistance brings my evolution. Please resist me. Lock me in solitary confinement. I'll close my eyes and admire the quality of the silence. I'll write rhymes in my mind, honestly, and define them, solidly redefine and memorize them until like a diamond when I come out, I'll be better than when I arrived in. Please resist me. Because resistance brings evolution and you've resisted me so consistently. I thank you for your contribution. I am a happy man. This stupidity has made me strong. I've developed wings, a thick skin and this here reposable thumb. It holds my pen, which loads my explodable tongue. So without loading a gun, I'm killing high quarters of unemotional punks. Sorry. You also taught me to speak French. I learned to when you kept keeping me at arm's length. Then I learned Italian just to expand my head and Greek to learn from where my ancestors had fled. And then I learned some Yanua just to show the people of this homeland some respect. You see, it's been your example that has led me to leave you for dead. So don't trust me. I'm risky. Insurmountable, unaccountable, I'm an undeniable, unreliable, maniacal liability. I fire soliloquies and my liturgies literally leave a literary litany. You see, when I was little, they told me I was illegitimate, illiterate, and limited. Little did they know that in a minute I'd be killing it. I'm vivid like in cinema, so my synonym is vividness. I stick it like I'm cinnamon and kill it like a militant. I live it like a citizen. You live life like imprisonment. Besides, indigenous immigrant might be the most legitimate of citizens, so it's better to live a life like us. Isn't it? That poem has become a bit of a symbol for what it is that I do and believe in. And any time an obstacle came into my way, I would look at it straight in the eye and say, please resist me. I'm ready. 
it's only going to make me stronger. But what did I learn? I also learned that defending my position is not enough to develop a full form of resilience. That I also have to what I also have to fill up what I was talking about before this pool of resources with things like my own culture or language, um, different forms of healing or growth, uh, my own mental health, different types of tenacity. So I returned to a little piece of Greece up in uh, Upper Mount Gravatt, my grandmother's house, my yaya's house, to learn from my elders. And I quickly realized that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, for the resilience of my ancestors. And that in fact, none of us would be here if resilience wasn't already embedded in our DNA from all the things that we've already been through. And for Greek people with Greek ancestry, this means surviving 400 years of Ottoman occupation. And during that occupation, many children being stolen by Ottoman troops and forced to join the Ottoman army and come back and fight against their own people. Attempts at genocide, 500,000 Greeks were killed alongside Armenians and Assyrians of even greater number, plus the Nazi invasion of Greece. And when it comes to my own grandmother, the Nazi troops came to the different villages where she was from. And in one of those villages, they lined up all the men in the village that were not Jews, they were just local Greeks and that were all massacred. 500 men were killed that day called the massacre of Calabrita and the women and children were locked in a hall and that hall was set on fire and luckily they escaped but they escaped to find all of the men of the town passed away and the village on fire and similarly in my grandmother's own village where she was living they also lined up the men in that village and they were ready to also execute them and on the way to that place where they were going to execute them my grandmother's brother ran and decided to try and escape and the Nazi troops shot him and killed him as he was trying to escape. And eventually they didn't kill everybody in the town. They didn't execute all of the men and he was the only man that died. And my grandmother and him were very close. She has all the reasons in the world to be a hateful human being. Um, and yet what she taught me the most is how funny she can be and how comedy is actually a great form of resilience, an incredibly important form of resilience. And you can see in that photo before, she was the one riding that motorcycle with my mum in the sidecar and she had that sense of resilience. This poem is for her. My grandmother grew up between two wars in Greece. She lost her brother Christo to the Germans and named my mother Christina after him. Rare for a Greek woman. She had a divorce at 50 and has lived for 30 years with his photos still in the spare room. She's a green thumb. She drinks cordial from her own mandarins, drinks tea from her own chamomile bush and picks tomatoes whenever I say to her, yeah, yeah, I feel like a salata. She hardly went to school. But one day, when discussing all the time that I've spent studying at university and admiring all three different types of basil she has growing in her garden, she says to us, Look up. Eat two leaves basil every day. Good for the blood, good for the brain. They don't teach you that university. When my brother Elias says to her, You know, yeah, yeah, you really know a lot. You're really smart. She always replies, Yes, Ilya. I'm very education. So one day I decided to ask my grandmother about racism and whether it's okay for Greeks to still hate the Turks for what they did to us in the past. And she says, racism? No, just because some people naughty doesn't mean you throw the rest in the rubbish. Her name is Katarina Batunas, but her maiden name is Sarandavra. And Sarandavra literally means 40 eggs. And as the story goes, one of my great grandfathers fathers was bet by another villager to see if he can eat an omelet made entirely with 40 eggs without getting sick. And anyone who knows my appetite will know I'm very proud to say he won that bet. And so the nickname, Mr. 40 Eggs, Sarandavra, then got turned into the family name and was passed down the generations to my yaya. And today it's her birthday. So I say what we always do. May you live to a hundred. 
But she's 83, so instead of thanking me, she says, a hundred, God me, no thank you. Maybe a couple more years, then I go to sleep. Where are you gonna go to sleep, yeah, yeah? In the cemetery. I already buy a little house there. I don't afraid. Until then, she keeps stopping us from doing the dishes every time she cooks us a meal. She'll keep calling me to see if I'm too cold when I'm visiting Melbourne. She'll keep trying to slip me a $50 note every time I visit. And she'll keep telling me, look up, eat two leaves, Basil, every day. Good for the blood, good for the brain. They don't teach you that at university. So my grandmother taught me so much about laughing at ourselves, about laughing at the world, about keeping the simple things important in our lives, keeping them at the center so that we can remember what it is that keeps us alive, really? What are the most important things in our lives? She would always ask, are you happy? Are you healthy? Health is number one. It was at this point where I discovered that I was diagnosed as what's called an undermethylator. For those who don't know what methylation is, it's a process where minerals and nutrients are converted into serotonin or dopamine. I wasn't really doing that well, if at all. And undermethylators are more susceptible to psychosis, stress, depression, not producing serotonin or dopamine at all, obviously can send you down a hole. I also found out that we produce more serotonin and dopamine in our stomachs than in our brains. And I started working more deeply with diet, juice cleanses, crazy five day water fasts, quitting all stimulants. I tried absolutely everything and I started to get somewhere. But I also realized that it wasn't just about putting our dreams on hold and trying to heal first. I found that the, quite the opposite was the most powerful. The most beautiful thing was that I realized that we can spiral upwards instead of spiraling downwards when we start to put different measures of success on our lives, our mental health, our relationships, our physical health, not just monetary career-based things, but everything equally. And as each thing takes a step upwards, they all help each other keep rotating up the spiral towards something better, a life that we could call comfortable or at least not in a perpetual anxiety attack that's when i also started learning about my history listening to stories and connecting with cousins upon cousins upon cousins of family in greece and i learned about a family member called magdalini haralambu my great grandmother my grandfather's mother she was born in 1883 ironically or perhaps perfectly also the same year that Khalil Gibran was born and the same year that Nikos Kazantzakis was, was born and exactly a hundred years before I was born. She was the midwife of the village of Monolithos in Rhodes. They had no running water, no electricity. They lived very, very difficult, tough lives. And there she is right there, Magdalini Haralampu. She lost her husband and her only son to the magnetism of immigration. They left her in the village to raise her three daughters by herself and migrated to Australia to find a better way of life with the idea of returning or sending money home. Unfortunately, her husband, my great grandfather, never returned to Australia. And my grandfather did, but only after many decades. This photo is of the village in its higher time when there were many more people living there. And the story is that I've been told when I was given this photograph last time I visited there is that every single person in that photo was delivered by my great grandmother, not just the children, but also the adults. And even now when I return to the village and I meet someone that's say in their seventies or late sixties, they will also tell me that my great grandmother delivered them. And so that is uh, an indicator that she was delivering babies until she was about 80, 85 years old, and just, just before she passed away. And so her resilience lives on so deeply and so powerfully in the village that when people ask me who I am, I say to them that I'm the great grandson of mummy, which, which is literally She's referenced as the mother or the matriarch of the village and her reputation still shines on me. 
Imagine your reputation for resilience is so strong that your great grandson still gets some secondhand shine when he turns up in the village and says your name. And so she has taught me the transformative nature of resilience can eventually lead us to a point that we give back all that good energy and resource that we've built to overcome our struggles to the communities within which we live. My great grandmother taught me how to contribute to a more resilient society simply by offering her skills to people who needed it. It doesn't seem like activism, but what could be more impactful to a community than literally delivering healthy human beings into the world for their mothers and continuing, continuing that legacy of survival to, for their descendants? This poem is called Athena. Athena, the goddess my ancestors once worshipped, still sits perched upon the columns of the Acropolis, make no mistake. The circling bird that would sit on Socrates' shoulder, whispering to the ear of Pythagoras and who wiped the tears from my great, 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 great grandmother's face. She came to me right after my Trojan War, as I laid upon the ocean floor, covered by the weight of my own tears, by a crevice of brothers who I've lost who should now be men, a shipwreck of another I may never trust again, and a barnacle encrusted rubble of a love that should have never come to an end, she came to me. She loomed as large as my own pain, spread her wings to be the size of my own faith, and motioned me to take from her that which would now be used to inscribe my own name. She closed her eyes as I grasped the feather and hardly quivered as I ripped the quill from her chest. Take it, she said. And as I did, I saw the millions of ships that she'd witnessed thick with my fellow countrymen, soldiers, pirates, all writing notes home to their wives on lines of papyrus. I saw Homer writing the Iliad and Odyssea, Prophetess Elias writing love letters to Medea, Achillea reading scrolls to the minions and Plato just taking a note before he voiced an opinion. I saw them all. And at that moment, Apollo stood forth, took the quill from my hand, took the black sticky ink from the most ancient squid and filled it and said, look, uh, write with this ink and may it come to your defense as it has for this old squid against every fisherman who has ever lived as it has for every anarchist, freedom fighter and activist. They'll tell you actions speak louder than words until your words make people act like this. And at that moment, King Constantino stood for and sang, Christos anesti ek nekron Thanaton, thanaton patisas Ke tisentis ni mazi zoi Lucas Haralambos, he said, your, your name means light, joy, illuminated. Your first name is the same name as the first saint who painted the first icons that line our churches and are worshipped every day. You shall not be afraid. And at that moment, the ocean began to fall. The waves crashing above me began to look like clouds again, and I began to feel something like proud again. All of my ancestors stood forth and said to me, look, uh, write with this quill, so that when your great, 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 great granddaughter is in pain and needs to be free, when you then come and stand with us so we all can give her exactly what she needs. May our air in your lungs speak new words with your tongue. Sickle, bano, stand up, son. You have only just begun. So this conversation then led me towards a deeper look at Greek mythology and one of the longest standing, most powerful and important stories of resilience, that of Odysseus, the main character from Homer's epic, The Odyssey. I've been writing a retelling or a reinterpretation of the Odyssey called Odysseus over the past five years with an orchestra 
and a composer from the Sydney Conservatorium named James Humberstone. It has been an epic journey in itself to get it to the point where we may be looking to premiere it properly next year. Many of you, some of you maybe, have seen a version of this, maybe when we performed in Sydney or we did a private performance in Melbourne. But I've learned some really deep, important lessons from Odysseus and the Odyssey about resilience. Some of you may know that it is the story of the journey of Odysseus from the coastlines of Troy, modern day Turkey, to safety on a Greek island of Ithaca to find his family again. And that journey takes him 10 years and he goes through many different things, many different obstacles on his way home. One of them is the beautiful voices, the singing of the sirens, that, whose voices are so beautiful that sailors can't help but steer their ships towards them, crashing and dying on the rocks. And in the Odyssey, Odysseus plugs his men's ears so that they can row. He is one of those characters that just keeps coming up against all of the difficult things that life throws at him, and he keeps facing it again and again and again with the help of the goddess Athena. And the main thing we learn from the chapter around the sirens is that he was able to keep his focus on the horizon, keep his focus on his destination, even with all of the different voices pulling him in different directions, all of the different distractions. Even if some of you meditate, you'll understand that when you sit and these thoughts come in and you can either follow them all the way down the rabbit hole or you can just let them pass. And this is what we learn from Odysseus's journey with the sirens. He is able to pass them without being pulled into his own demise, which Every moment of the day, we get distracted. You know, all those moments that we get those tiny distractions, if we add them all up, it can lead to a life of distraction. And so this is a big part of resilience, staying focused on our own growth and healing and destination and, and horizon. We also learn a lot from his battle with the Cyclops. The Cyclops has one eye in the middle of its forehead and it eats a number of Odysseus's men. And in that process of eating a number of Odysseus's men, Odysseus has to think up how to overcome. And he overcomes all of that, um, that monstrosity by stabbing it in the eye, blinding the Cyclops. And in the process of lulling the Cyclops to sleep and stabbing the Cyclops in the eye, he tells the Cyclops a fake name. He calls himself Odys which means no body. And afterwards, when the Cyclops has been stabbed in the eye and it's screaming and it is telling its father, Poseidon, that someone has blinded him, Odysseus could have just gotten in his boat and gone home. He could have just quietly slipped away, said nothing, escaped and kept on his journey. But instead, because he was overcoming such a great obstacle, his ego got the better of him. And he shouted back at the Cyclops and said, great Cyclops, my name is not Odys, my name is Odysseus, son of Laertes, Polymichanos. So he gives himself away to the Cyclops because his ego got the better of him. And in that moment, Poseidon then became Odysseus's biggest enemy and creates the next however many obstacles that face Odysseus on his way home. And so this is another lesson that I've learned along the process of being resilient to never celebrate too hard that you've overcome something because you never know when life's going to, you know, throw another stone at you from a distance like the Cyclops does to Odysseus's ship. Or you never know when Poseidon's going to whip up another storm for you to try and traverse. And so this is another great lesson that we learned from Odysseus. Something that I've learned in terms of modern day stories and paralleling them with the ancient story of Odysseus is that Odysseus is traveling from the coastlines of Troy, which is modern day Turkey, trying to find safety on a Greek island, just as people today are trying to find safety after fleeing war, escaping off the borders or the coastlines of modern day Turkey and trying to find safety on Greek islands and enter into Europe some of them refugees from different countries, especially Syria. And so I wrote this poem as a part of Odysseus. 
It's called the perfect storm. So now from Turkey to Greece, they accomplish the same feat. And it's a new type of boat, but it sinks in the same sea. And it's a new kind of war, but it's the same reason to flee. And it's a new enemy, but it's the same odyssey. And yet we're calling that a classic. And we're calling this an act, like we can't fathom what is happening till long after the fact. Will it take 3,000 more years for us to see that history just repeats? And it doesn't matter if Odysseus is Muslim or Greek. And will it take more to see we help start all these wars? So we're a part of the cause. We got them caught in the perfect storm. And that small snippet of that poem from Odysseus really does sum up this idea that actually it's extremely important for us to understand the resilience that is sitting within our communities, the people that have survived so many um, adversities and traversed so many obstacles to be able to be here. Not only refugees or migrants, um, average everyday people are fighting battles that we don't know. And of course, First Nations people in Australia, we have to recognize as well. And before I get on to talk about uh, a great sportsman of Australian history and his resilience, I'd like to just talk a little bit about this term rapsodia in ancient Greek. There is an image of a, an ancient pot that is really powerful that I think that we could show. It talks about how this, uh, this term rapsodia in ancient Greek actually means to stitch together and to stitch together is a term that is referencing how the poets stitch together different stanzas of a poem to create one long tapestry. But I also believe that it means to stitch together society, that we are stitched together when we see and experience art and poetry, when people tell stories that are similar to ours. Like right now, when I'm telling you all this that I'm going through, I'm sure that you are also finding your own meaning in amongst mine. And somehow we get stitched closer together and become tighter as a community and society through that process of storytelling. This image is an image of an ancient Greek rhapsode, rhapsodia, uh, stitcher togetherer. And if you can see, there's tiny white dots coming out of his mouth. And when you get closer, and the archaeologists have researched this, those tiny little dots aren't dots. They're actually letters of a stanza of the Iliad. So that is a depict depiction of a great ancient rhapsode. And they would speak with these staffs and they would knock them on the ground while keeping rhythm um, with the story so that they can tell that story to the crowd um, in time. And I was talking to a great friend of mine, um, a rapper and uh, excellent human being, a poet, singer, uh, Fred Leone, the other day. He just started up a new podcast called Yarns with Fred. And it made me think of this, how we talk about spinning yarns and talking to each other through yarning and how we stitch together story and rhapsodes and rhapsodia and how this all works. And so, of course, I couldn't talk about Fred and I also couldn't talk about resilience or Adam Goods without talking about this documentary called The Australian Dream. It is an extremely powerful documentary. And what Adam Goods experience brings up so much resilience, stadiums full of taunts, racial vilification, week in and week out, uh, social media going crazy, the pundits online and different channels calling him all sorts of different names and, and delegitimizing his idea of what racism really is. And in his darkest moment, he did something that I fully understand and that I think many of us would understand. He returned to country. He returned to the place where he knows he is safe. He returned to nature. He returned to the stories of his ancestors. He returned to the con connection between himself and the land. And this is something that we all do in some way, perhaps not as deeply or as intricately as our First Nations people do um, in their connection to this country. But we all need that connection to land. And we all need to, in some ways, look after our own pockets of land that we may be living on or near in order to draw that resource of resilience and give ourselves 
more of that store to be able to face the difficult things in life. And he also has built up his resilience to a point of giving back through his foundation, the Go Foundation, which is all about empowering through education. If you haven't seen this documentary, um, The Australian Dream, please do. It is extremely important, vital, I would say, for everybody to watch. And just as Adam Goods is working through education to give back, uh, as you saw earlier in my speech, I have been able to work with young people all over the planet. I've been able to connect with incredible human beings that I call friends and inspirations, one of them being Jack Noble here. I met Jack many years ago at a school called Chatham High School in Tari. He had a degenerative disease health issue that he knew was not going to get better. He could not talk or walk or move his body in the way he would have liked to, but his brain worked perfectly. He would express that his brain felt like it was in a cage. He was caged by his body. And even though he couldn't talk, we got along and he came to a workshop that I was giving, a whole series of workshops for a week at his school. And he came with his carer and they asked if they could join in. And I didn't know how that would work. I was a bit ignorant, to be honest, about what his process would be to write with me. But he sat there with his carer and she had a sheet that had the letters of the alphabet on it. And every time she pointed to a letter of the alphabet that he recognized and liked, he would squeeze her hand a little tighter or blink or give her a sign. And so it would go like this, one letter at a time, slowly, meticulously, writing out one word at a time, one line at a time. And over the course of a week, while all the other students had perhaps written three poems and rubbed them all out and ended up with nothing or maybe something quite short, he was meticulously writing and actually composing the poem in his head because he knew he didn't have time to lose. And at the end of that week, Jack had composed with Marilyn Connors, his carer, a poem. And I was lucky enough to read that poem with Jack on stage. I was at lucky enough to be his voice in that moment and there was not a dry eye in the room he said things like take care of each other take care of yourselves appreciate what you have i will never fall in love i will never have a child i will never hold uh, my child in my arms i will never grow old respect what you have i can hear you when you talk about me in the corridors come to me talk to me make jokes with me I want to hear your voices. I want to know you. And it was the first time they'd heard him express himself in, in that way. And I said to Jack, if you write a book of 30 poems, if you write 30 poems, I will promise I will help you publish a book. And I didn't know if that was ever going to happen, knowing how difficult it would be for him. And two years later, I received a package in the mail, 30 poems by Jack Noble. And we returned to his place, to his school, and a local mob came out and gave him uh, an incredible welcome and local uh, newspapers and, and news stations came out with their cameras and it was a big story for the local community. And he gave so much to people in that moment, so much hope to people in that moment. And I stood on stage with him and read all 30 poems in a row, the whole book from start to finish. Um, to the crowd and everybody was just raps. It was a, it was a very powerful day. And when people ask me who are my favorite poets, Jack Noble was one of them up there because of his resilience, because of his ability to persist. I also had another experience in another school with a student named Michaela. And Michaela, if you're watching right now, I want to send a shout out to you. And thank you so much for sending me your poem after these all these years. We were able to work together in a center that was a, about assisting young people that kind of fall, slip through the cracks of mainstream schooling. And I had a workshop process that was about writing a breakup letter to an inanimate object. And most of the time, this is funny, like, dear basketball, when I first met you, we were meant to be for each other. And now, just because I broke my ankle, you want to see someone else. Or dear maths, I thought we were going to be friends but you're just way too complex for me. And usually it is something funny, but Michaela wrote something extremely powerful and brave. She wrote, Dear Razorblade, 
I remember when we first met. I was in eighth grade when you graced across the soft white wrists. You told me how to release my pain in a way no one else could. I couldn't believe that something so small could make so much pain feel so good. I'm writing this to tell you it's time to take a break for good. You've caused me harm for years now. It needs to end. I'm sorry, you just didn't make the cut to stay in my life. I get shivers now just reading it. And at the time, the room was dead silent. It was one of the most powerful things I've been able to witness. And I'm extremely thankful for that. For that. And in those moments, I've seen young people be able to achieve incredible things. I've seen them change the room, change their teachers' opinions of them. I've seen one boy read a similar type of poem to that one that Michaela did, and the whole class afterwards got up and lined up to hug him one by one. And these are 13 and 14 year olds. And there is compassion, there is power, there is strength, there is love, there is vulnerability, there is honesty in amongst young people in Australia, but we need to give them the space to do that. And if not, then they end up, like many of us, much older, and with a lot of backlog of things that we need to be talking about and dealing with now. But it's not all dark and it's not all heavy. I've seen how that process lifts the heaviness once the issue is named in the room. I've seen how it affects community, uh, whether it's in a school or in a venue like the New York Poets Cafe, I've seen communities become educated on each other when the television or political rhetoric is taken out of the equation of us getting to know each other. We do not need any middleman to hear each other's stories. I realize that my activism really is in helping facilitate these vulnerable and honest moments to break down barriers of fear between young people and adults and to slowly, one line at a time, work to strengthen and tighten the fabric of our communities, one workshop, classroom or performance or speech at a time. And so now the good news for me is that since I've been spiraling upwards, great things have been able to happen and I've been able to give back and offer similar experiences to people around the planet. One of them is the Rhodes Poetry Retreat, which is a retreat that I run in that very same village where my great grandmother was the midwife of the village. I now get to welcome people into that village, into my family, to hang out on ancient sites, to sit on the edge of cliffs and write poems and it's safe by the way there's a ledge under there i promise and we are able to create great memories and give people the freedom to write their own stories and create great new narratives for themselves and in all of this in all these years since this whole thing started for me when it comes to considering resilience i've learned a few important things i've learned that it's important to listen to and understand other people's stories of resilience, to be able to trigger our own resilient DNA, which we, this is why we must defend the arts, why we must keep people writing and performing and back at their desks and back on their stages, because we need these stories to be able to pull from our own DNA to survive difficult times. I've also learned to invest deeply into my own healing, physical, mental, spiritual, cultural, whatever it is, and to change my measures of success, to change my measures of success from being solely monetary or career-based to deeper, bigger, more important things, even more important things than myself, so that I can begin to do that spiraling upwards towards a better sense of self. I've also learned that it's important to know myself because if meditation doesn't work for me and I'm going to spend uh, 10 years wasting my time doing that because I don't know myself, it's much better for me to know myself first, skip the wastage of 10 years and try something else that I know is better for me. So knowing thyself is extremely important. Also, to never underestimate the power of the planet, of country, of the earth. This is possibly the greatest pool of resource that we have the greatest pool of healing and connection that there is and something that none of us can escape. We all live within this controlled environment that we must take care of. 
And in that also to make sure that once we find our resilience, that our cups spilleth over, that we give back to one another in order to increase the durability and resilience of society at large. Each one teach one is what hip hop would say about that, to make sure that we pass on these things through being a mentor and also being mentored. And also from my yaya, from me to you, to always keep our sense of humor alive. Do not ever forget that we are just ants living on a big, big blue and green ball at the end of the day. And yet we can be important players. We can be powerful in that as well. My name is Luca Lesson. This has been Building Resilience, a poet's guide presented by Think Inc. First question from Joshua Donovan. How slash where did you first manage to work up the courage to perform spoken word on stage? I first performed a rap a cappella at a poetry slam in Brisbane called Speed Poets on Brunswick Street there. And I have to admit that I cannot lie and say that I was extremely nervous or that I was scared on, of getting on stages. I'm a weird personality in that sometimes I feel more comfortable on stage than I do off stage in public. So as long as I'm prepared and, I'm, and I've fully memorized something and I'm, you know, I've rehearsed it a million times, then I usually don't get nervous. And I wasn't really nervous that day because I knew what I was going to do. Um, but for other people, I understand that that's difficult. And I just say that practicing the heck out of something till you're almost sick of it is the best way to, to dull the nerves. Awesome. So let's move on to our second question. We heard you spitting some pretty quick poems in there. So from Naomi Blair, how did you learn to speak so fast for your poems? Good question. I actually practice faster than I perform them. So it is almost like running around the oval with bricks in your hands and it's difficult and then you drop the bricks and it feels easy. I would go even faster. So when I practice, it's like, they told me I was illegitimate, a little bit limited, little than the new middle, I'm killing a little less. I go so fast that it's ridiculous. So then when I slow it down, I actually feel more comfortable and I can articulate every word. Awesome. That's awesome advice. Okay, next question. Nick Ingresiani, what practices helped you hone your own voice? I'm finding it hard to step beyond mimicry when I write, perform. Yeah, look, I think there's a lot to be said. A lot of authors and writers will say, consume as much as you can. Watch as many YouTube videos of slam poets. Um, listen to as many things as possible. Read as many books as possible. And I really do ag agree with that to a certain extent. But I also think there's uh, not enough is said around the power of cutting out other voices, not listening to other poets, not listening to other rappers, to to let your own style creep up on you just by leaving space for it. So maybe now that you're already writing, um, maybe it is time for you to take two months off listening to other poets and listening to other rappers and just slowly delving into who you are as an artist and finding who you are. We all imitate. It's not um, a bad thing. It's a great step forward. But I think that it's important to, to maybe quiet the voices for a while. Great. Now from David Noble, do you, f do you face writing blocks? And if so, how do you overcome them? Yeah. So with writer's block, there's a few things you can, I do. One is strap myself to the chair and table and don't stop till it's done. <laughs> Just persevere. <laughs> um, the other one is the opposite of that. Get it, get the hell away from it. Clear your head do something else, um, don't write something else, actually do something that is maybe physical or away from writing um, so you get a fresh perspective on what it is that you're writing. Uh, and the third thing I would say, which is something that often comes up for me, is just different forms of stream of consciousness. So put a timer on, say, for 10 or 20 minutes or even an hour, grab your snacks, turn off the internet and write for 20 minutes or an hour, however long, straight, 
anything and everything that's in your mind. And maybe, just maybe, one or two of those lines will be half decent. And that can be the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. You know, that can be that, that final thing that you needed just to get the wheels moving again. And sometimes that stream of consciousness can be around a theme or it can be answering a certain question or it can be with the same start, start of each line. You might start a line with all I know is and you might start that for 20 minutes, the same line. All I know is another answer. All I know is something else. And just keep, just keep the juices flowing. But if it's still not working, I advise actually to get away from it, let it marinate for a couple of days. I love that advice. All right, from Tina Jensen. Before you write a new poem, do you have a goal or subject in mind? And is there any practice you do to get in the zone or do you just flow with whatever comes? I think there's two types of poems for me. One is the poem that I know what it's going to be. I'm like, I've got an idea for a poem. I think I know the title of the poem already. It's this. And I'm going to go execute that idea that I have. Usually in the process of writing that poem, I discover a lot during the writing of that poem. But still, it seems to sit within the same range of what I thought it was going to sit in. And the first thing I do is write the title and then I finish, you know, I go through the poem and do some research and execute it. The other type of poem is a poem that, that comes from a subconscious. I just sit down and write and I write and I write and I write and I write. And in amongst what I've written, there's things that I think are worthy and I pull them out and I maybe put them in an order and I fill in the gaps and I start looking at it, figuring out what it is and I start refining what I'm trying to say. And then I finish that poem and the last thing I do is put the title on top. And so they kind of come from two different realms for me, two different processes. To be honest, though, every poem that I've written has a slightly different process i think it's difficult to ask me what's your writer's process i don't really have a single process i don't have a single thing that i do to get me in the mood poems come to me when i don't want them you know when i'm in the middle of a meeting or when i'm in the middle of a performance on stage and someone you know and, I, and i'm sometimes i can think about other things while performing a poem at the same time and i'm thinking hmm that would be a good poem i should write that when i get home so like you can't it's it's difficult to say what is my process? But those are the two types of poems that I usually go for. Something that I've intentionally gone out and set out to execute and other things that I let bubble up. Great. Uh, we have another question here from Ellie Pearl. The question is, well, he starts off with Yasu. I am just starting Yasu. to explore poetry and performing. Can you give me any tips about cultivating and staying in flow states that keep me downloading and let my creativity flow? Hmm. Interesting. It's, it's a difficult one because if I told you mine, it wouldn't work for you. You know, if I tried to give you that advice, I don't think it would necessarily be me, um, you know, transfer to other people. Your flow state or, you know, a lot of people talk about this, you know, perfect medium between the pressure of needing to write something and the ease with which we can flow out and do our writing may be helped by some structure. So maybe write down the side, or if you're coming to my workshops after this, you can write down the side of your page a bunch of, bunch of different prompts and then just fill in the gaps of those prompts. I find that structure actually really helps me with my writing. Um, my new show that I've been working on is called Agape and Other Kinds of Love. And that's structured by talking about the different types of love. So each scene basically is a different type of love. And that helps me. Some people think that that's like some cool thing that I'm trying to do to impress people. But actually, I find it way easier to write like that when I've given myself a, a really strong structure. And that helps me flow within the limits of that structure. So maybe that could help to design your own structure and then stick with it and also be comfortable to break those rules. But you need the rules to break them. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So last audience question for you, Luca, from Bonnie Taylor. What are some of the poems that mean the most to you? And who are some of the poets who have inspired you? Hmm. Hmm. Some of the poems that mean the most to me. That's a huge question. 
I think <laughs> that, for instance, I, I'm going to answer this question the way I perceive the word poetry. So I put hip hop and rap in that category as well. So uh, Tupac had a poem or a rap called Brenda's Got a Baby. And that really woke me up when I first heard that. It's about teen pregnancy in the United States in poorer communities. And it really educated me and entertained me. And it was a powerful moment of awakening. It wasn't like I'm going to be a rapper one day or I'm going to be a poet. It was just like, damn, from the start of that rap to the end of that rap, I learned something deeply about that person's community in a story that rhymed with a beat and a chorus, you know. Um, so that hit me and that was probably one thing that sent me on my journey. And then the whole of the prophet, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet, was probably another thing that really smacked me on the back of the head and said, this is, you know, important. And it's something that I constantly go back to for reference, even though it's gotten a bit of a not so cool reputation among poets these days, I still think it stands up as a really powerful project. And then I guess the third thing I would throw in there is, is Homer's work, is the Odyssey. And I know that they're all kind of um, obvious choices for me, but I see myself as working as in an amalgamation of those three artists or those three bodies of work, like Greek mythology and ancient Greek stuff, hip hop influence, um, and the kind of romanticism of, of Khalil Gibran. Somewhere in there, I, I think I, I find myself in there. But as a modern day poet, I'll have to say there's friends of mine like Omar Musa and other crew that I just love, rappers that I love. Um, shout out to El Fresh, shout out to you know, all of that crew. But also there's a poet from the UK named Raymond Antrobus who has a really incredible poem, uh, a really incredible book called The Perseverance, which is really powerful as well. 